Welcome back to our ongoing series of videos on the analysis of parallel cord trusses. In the previous lecture, we looked at cantilevered trusses using the simplified joints method and the sections method. In this particular video, we're going to focus on solving problems of that sort, trusses with cantilevers using multi-frame. In particular, we're going to look at a 17 square bay truss with one five bay cantilever, which was solved in the textbook using the simplified joints method. Uh, that means we'll have our results in multi-frame, which we can compare to the previous solution method. So this is a drawing of the 17 square bay truss uh, it has parallel cords, a top cord, a bottom cord, and two support points, one of which is five bays in, which produces the five bay cantilever, and the other support is at the other extreme end of the truss. In this case, in multi-frame, we're going to put in a 1K force. Uh, multi-frame does not know what a P-force is but we can put in any value that we want and we can scale things accordingly. So we're going to use multi-frame to find the axial forces in the members in this truss. The solution is independent of scale, so you may choose any bay size that you like. I'm going to set this up with each bay equal to one foot. You can make it five feet, 10 feet, or whatever you would like to do. The results will be the same because everything is based on proportioning. As long as we know how we have a 17 bay truss with a 5 bay cantilever and that all the bays are square and that the webs are going in the direction that are indicated here, we will get exactly the same result regardless of the scale of the truss. As long as the only force system that we're looking at is 1K on each of the interior joints and half a K on each of the end joints. In order to get multi-frame to do an analysis, you must specify member cross-sections. But the exact cross-section you choose, just like the dimension of the bay, is not crucial since you will not be accounting for the self-weight of the members in this analysis, and you are also not addressing stress in this analysis. You are merely trying to find the internal, internal axial forces under the external forces that are shown above. In doing this analysis and in setting up the frame, make sure that you put a pin joint at one support. It doesn't make any difference which one it is. And then restrain and then only restrain the vertical and lateral movements at the other support. Uh, and I shouldn't really say a pin joint because if we put a pin joint there, the thing would flop to side, from side to side. So we're going to have to add a few other constraints, uh, but that will be clear uh, as we go through this example. The key point is you cannot restrict the movement of both of these support points in the direction along the direction of the truss, because if you do that, you do not allow the bottom cord of the truss to participate properly in the action of the truss. Since severe forces will be generated at the supports, uh, which will uh, influence the outcome of your analysis. Also, when using multi-frame, make sure that you specify appropriate member end releases that will assure that multi-frame computes forces corresponding to a pure truss, that is, a, a pure true force member system. And all this is going to be demonstrated in this video. So we're going to go to multi-frame. Um, we're going to add a member, which I'm going to set at the origin, and I'm going to put it any arbitrary place. And I'm going to make it 17 feet long, and I'm going to make y equal to zero so that it's horizontal. And we have that member right there. And now I'm going to subdivide this member, which we can either do con control break on the keyboard, or we can come down and pick subdivide member. And we'll pick 17 parts. 
and each one of these segments is going to be one foot long. Now, for reasons that aren't necessarily apparent now, but will be apparent, I'm going to remove the design member. And the reason is that, I, as I indicated in the intro introduction, you would like to do member releases that effectively create a pin joint at every joint. Now, we could lasso everything in the structure, all these joints, and we could go over here and we could make them a pin joint, which we would do right here. The problem with that is a pure pin joint releases all rotations and the computer will come back and say, the structure you specified makes no sense. It's not stable. So we would prefer to not have the computer say that to us. So we're gonna subdivide these things and then we're going to do some member end releases. And we can go ahead and do that right now. Um, we're going to go member releases. And we're going to select the moment about the z-axis. So actually this is the z-prime axis of the member. So the census member is horizontal. The, the global x-coordinate is actually corresponding to the x-prime coordinate, which is the axial coordinate of the member. Z, the global coordinate, is corresponding to the minor axis, or excuse me, major axis bending about Z prime, which is uh, an axis that's actually parallel to Z here. Z and Z prime are, for this particular member, the way I've oriented it, uh, they have the same orientation. I would like to make sure that these members can rotate in that manner to simulate the effect of a pin joint. I'm not releasing the rotation about this vertical axis because that would be equivalent to picking this pin joint right here and it will effectively make the structure unstable. So I'm only going to release the moments about the Z prime axis for these members. And you'll notice by the way that it puts a little circle at each end of the members, which says something has been released there. And if you want to know what, you need to go check it. <coughs> so now I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to go duplicate it. And I'm going to move it up one foot. And now I have my top and bottom cords. So now I'm going to go introduce the web members and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to zap here, there, there, there. And there are other ways that are slightly faster, but just to keep everything simple, I'm going to do it like that. And now I'm going to zoom in on this and I can be a little more accurate. And I'm going to put in some web members going this way till I get to the midpoint between the two supports. So I'm three bays in, four bays, five bays, and six bays. And now I'm going to take this connected members tool again. And by the way, I can do this in the frontal view. One of the problems in multi-frame is you, if you do that, you can inadvertently grab a joint or a member and move it without realizing that you've done that. So I tend to work overwhelmingly in the 3D view where I've set it so that I can't drag the joints or the members. And by the way, if you want to know how to do that, unfortunately, my dialog boxes are off the screen here, so I won't demonstrate that to you. But I will tell you, if you go to Edit Preferences, um, you get a dialog box that looks like this, and you write somewhere here... Um,
you want to make sure you turn off drag note nodes in 3D and drag elements in 3D. So you notice these are neither one clicked because I don't want that to happen. Okay, so here's one support point which I'm going to select and now I'm going to go up to member joint restraint and I'm going to say X, Y, Z and rotation about X and rotation about Y. In other words, I'm not letting this thing go up and down in rotation. Um, I'm not letting it rotate about the X axis. In other words, it can't flop over if I, if I constrain it in that manner. But I do not want to restrain it against rotation about uh, the Z prime axis because I'd like to make the system as free as possible to rotate in that manner. I'm going to click OK. Then I'm going to go down to this end. And I'm going to go to Joint Restraint again. And now I'm going to say um, I'm not going to click X. Because if I click X, then the joints, or the two restraints, or the support points, are supplying all the forces in the direction of the bottom cord and thereby they negate the function of the bottom cord. So I'm going to leave this one unchecked but I don't want the end to fall down. Um, I don't want it to move from left to right or in other words in this direction. Um, I don't want it to rotate about the x-axis or about the y-axis, but again, I'm going to not restrain rotation about Z because I want these joints to act as hinge joints, hinge joints or pin joints. So now I've done all that, and I'm going to select everything here, and I'm going to go give it a member, and I seem to have shut that dialog box, so I'm going to go look at the toolbars and uh, unfortunately this is not on your screen um, now i'm going to pull up the member toolbox which i'm going to put right there and now i want to go pick a section and uh, I don't think you can see this, but now you can. I'm going to go to hollow steel section rectangular, and I'm going to drag all the way down to the bottom. And by the way, you may think that one kip forces are large and that you um, may need large members for this, but these are really small forces, and we've drawn it as a pretty small truss. So I don't have any serious buckling issues. I'm just going to pick the smallest rectangular section I can. And by the way, I'm only doing this as a, as a rectangular section rather than a square or round because at some point I might want to rotate some sections depending on how they end up. And I just like to be able to look at the rendered version and see if they're sitting vertical or horizontal. Um, probably that's not going to rise as an issue because I think the way I'm setting this up, that's not going to be crucial. But I'm going to click OK here. And now I have all that done. I'm going to go to my Loads window. And I'm going to look at it from the front. And I'm going to hit Control Total. And now I'm going to lasso all these joints. And I'm going to Load global joint load and i'm sorry you can't see it but it's right up at the top global joint load one kip then i'm going to select these two end joints and i'm going to say uh, global joint load 0.5 kips so now i have all my loads and i can go to my analysis window or my results window and now I need to analyze, and I'm going to do a frontal view. And now I know I've done something wrong because I came up in the moment window and I'm seeing a bunch of moments. And now I know what I didn't do. I did not release the ends of my sloping members. So you see all my sloping members 
have uh, got major moments in them, and they're also inducing moments in the vertical members. So I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to say uh, select, and I, I can't show this to you, but I'm going to say um, select member slope. I'm sorry, this is not on your image. And then you have a choice. Oh. And I'm going to pick sloping. And now I'm going to go to frame and I'm going to do joint restraint. And I'm going to, whoops, that's not what I want. I want member releases. And again, I'm going to release the moments about the, the major axis. And I'm going to click OK. And now I'm going to analyze linear. And I'm going to go to my results window. And now this is exactly what we want to see because we're in moments up here and it's saying there are no moments in this system, which means it's being analyzed as a series of pin joints. But we, we uh, systematically released various constraints or end restraints on the members so it doesn't just flop over or become uh, a pile of sticks, basically. So we got the analysis to work. We have zero moment in all the members. And now we want to go and look at axial force. So that's what this PX is, is the axial force in the members. And now this looks a little jumbled because some of the flags are being drawn on top where we have compression on the top. Some of them are being drawn on the bottom where we have tension. But in here we have compression, which is being drawn on top. And in these members, we have tension and those flags are being drawn on the bottom and they're overlapping each other and the numbers just don't seem to make any sense. We can try to clean this up by going to display and under plot, we can put, we want to put it at a scale of 0.5. And now they're not totally on top of each other, but they're still pretty hard to discern. So we're going to play some games with this. And by the way, drawing compression on top and 10 on the bottom was a technique that got developed before we even had color screens to work on. And they've maintained that convention. But in the case of an analysis like this, it becomes a little jumbled. Um, we can clean this up a little more by going to our plot and making this a 0.3. And now all of a sudden we can kind of see the the uh, tension forces on the top and the compression forces on the bottom cords. And if we zoomed in, we could probably see things even better there in terms of the numbers not being jumbled on top of each other. But we're going to play a little game here. We're going to go to our display and we're going to look at member actions and we're going to pick axial tension. So right now we're in just total axial force compression and tension are being designated by whether they occur above or below the member. In other words, whether the flag representing that force is above or below the member. But we would like to separate out tension and compression so that we can understand a little better what's going on here. So we're going to go to axial <coughs> tension and we get this diagram right here. Now, I'm going to play with this and sort of massage it around. Uh, what I'm doing here will probably end up being very similar to what you do, but uh, these are things we just sort of have to play with. So a couple of things I want to comment on here. There's a certain color now that's going to be the color for tension, which is this kind of cyan color. Um, this member has this width of flag representing the magnitude of the force in it. Um, that member is in tension, which is why there's a number there. This member up here is not in tension. In fact, it's in compression. So you're seeing a zero and that zero means there's no tension in it. It doesn't mean there's no force in it. It means there's no tension in it. So I'm going to adjust this image 
and I'm just kind of guessing how it wants to turn out, but I'm going to make this 0 0.5. In other words, we're going to make the flags that represent these axial tensile forces half as large, just to sort of unclutter the view. So we have a bunch of members with zero that are in compression up here, a bunch of members here that are in compression, so they have zero tension. And we're seeing tension in the chord forces there, tension in the chord forces here, and almost all of these members, uh, the, the web members are almost all in tension. So now that we've done that, we're going to go look at um, display, member actions, and we're going to go to axial compression. Now, something, when you pull this up, it may not look this way, because I've been messing around with, with multi-frame, and I've made a few settings and one of my settings is that when I go to display, I want to look at customized plot. And you'll notice I'm in axial compression, but I've also checked the box that says axial tension. So when I did that, it was basically saying that I want a graphic display, which is showing the window I'm in, which is axial compression force. But I also want to superimpose on that the axial tension diagram. So I'm going to click on OK. I didn't have to do that because it was already set that way. But you will have to do that if you want to see both the tension and compression. So here we have the tension, which we were just fiddling with. And by the way, in that diagram, we set the magnitude of the, or the scaling factor for these flags to 0.5. We have not done that yet with our compression part, which is why this flag, which is 12.292, is only half as high as that one, because the yellow represents the compression flags, and I haven't gone through and scaled them. So I'm going to go up to um, Display, Plot, and again I'm going to adjust my scale to 0.5, and my sole purpose for doing this, by the way, is to just keep these flags from getting on top of each other and, and being distracting and confusing. So I'm going to click OK. And now I have a diagram that's showing compression on the bottom here, compression on the top there. These zeros, by the way, represent tension. These larger numbers represent the magnitude of the compressive force. And when we call these two diagrams in, it would be nice if all these zeros disappeared, but that is not one of the options. Okay, so we got a pretty good diagram here. I like the way it's going, but I have one other change that I would like to make. We have a region of fairly high axial forces here, and the logical response to that, if we were going to change the geometry of the truss, would be to make members larger or even make the depth of the truss larger. And I would like for our graphic technique to sort of create that illusion. Uh, I don't like the fact that all these flags representing compression on the bottom and tension on the bottom, on the top cords, are all jammed together like this. I would like for them to look more like that. And there's a little trick that we can use that's mainly just a graphic tool, which is the following. We're going to go back and for all these members, so up through there, the first eight members on the bottom cord, we're going to flip the member over. And when we flip the member over, it's going to flip the flags over. And we're going to do it on the top also, except on the top, we're going to just do it for the first seven members because after that it's compression. But after eight members on the bottom, then it flips from compression to tension. So we're going to go back here. And I want to do a frontal view just to make this easy to select. I'm do a control total. I'm going to lasso the first seven on the top. I'm going to lasso. Whoops, I need to hold my shift key. And now I'm going to go to member orientation, which is the orientation of the cross section. 
and I'm going to type in 180 degrees and I'm going to click OK. And now I'm going to go back to my plot window. I'm going to analyze linear. And now you'll notice we have this beautiful diagram. Um, tension is represented by cyan. Compression is represented by yellow. We're showing them always on the outside of whatever the chord member is. So for the top chords, it's on top. For the bottom chords, it's on the bottom. And you'll notice if we were going to, if we were going to vary the depth of this truss, these flags are kind of suggestive of how we would do that. So we'd want the truss to be deeper here and deeper there and deeper there and deeper there. But mainly I'm showing them this in this way to clean up the image and make it read better. So now we want to go back and we want to compare this to the numbers that we got in our uh, simplified uh, analysis. So here we have this truss, which has this weird uh, 12.042 p-force, which by the way, we didn't go through the analysis of that in this particular exercise because we didn't have to. Uh, it turns out that multi-frame calculates that for us already. And if we go through here, we see this yellow flag, which represents the compression in that member, is 12.042, which is exactly equal to this force right here. So also here we have 8P in tension. Here we have 8K. In this case, we're just exchanging. We're basically saying P is one kip. So P and K are the same thing. So we can very quickly check. Here we have 2.0, 2.0, 4.5, 4.5, 8, and 8, 5.958, 5.958, and so forth. So we're getting excellent correlation between our multi-frame analysis and our simplified joints method. And we can continue to track that on through. So here we have 11.75 and 11.75, and so forth. And by the way, we have... This end reaction of 4.958, which goes straight into that member. And here we have a member with this yellow flag representing compression, and it is 4.958. So that concludes our video on using multi-frame to analyze uh, parallel cord trusses with cantilevers.